Well, it's wonderful to see all of you. And I think we're going to have an opportunity to share some memories and also talk about the future of CMC. Maybe, Jack, we can start with you. Uh, you came to the college, and one of the first things you did was start the Athenaeum. Can you tell us a little bit about the Athenaeum and your vision for it? The late 60s and 70s were kind of a time of great turmoil on the college campuses. And uh, when I took over, actually, and uh, after Howard Neville, we thought that uh, we had to find a way to get close to students. So we uh, started what later became the Athenaeum by uh, having dinners at the, what was in the president's house on the campus and inviting faculty and, and, and others over. And that became very popular, and it went from there to become the Athenaeum it is today. Oh, that's fantastic. And the Athenaeum is such a distinguishing part of our campus and culture. Another major milestone among many that you were able to deliver to Claremont was the decision to go co-education in 1976. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that process and how you were able to get the votes to make this college co-education? Well, the, the class at, uh, of 70, when, the or, when they um, entered CMC, all the women had parietal hours. By that, I, by that I mean they locked the women up at night. Women had to be in their dorms at 10 o'clock. They got so many times to be out after that, but you had to sign a slip that said where you were going and who were going with. It was kind of like checking a book out of the library. They wanted to make sure you'd bring <laughs> it back. Uh, by 1970, those parietal hours had disappeared. The women's movement was sweeping the campus, and single men campuses started to go co-educational. So I suggested to the board that we should investigate this possibility. And we looked at actually three possibilities. This is not generally known. The first was to say single sex male. The second was to go coordinate with scripts, where we would have co ed dorms with scripts, we would have a common uh, distribution requirement, et cetera. So we met with uh, a group of the scripts trustees, and uh, it was clear scripts did not want to get engaged. Uh, so, uh, so that option was out. The other option was, of course, to, to either be single sex or to go co-ed. I was uh, very lucky to have a uh, chairman, uh, John Loveless, who was very process-oriented. And we spent a half a year kind of deciding how we would decide. And we would get all the information we could get. We would take a vote of everyone we could think of to the, to the board. We would uh, not change our curriculum. We would keep the same curriculum that we had. We would not do affirmative action on the women. We would take the best candidates, regardless of sex. And we would not initially change the name. And it would take a two-thirds vote of the board. Jill and I thought that uh, if we got a majority of vote, uh, we could survive for another vote. If, if we didn't get a majority, that it was time for us to move on. We got the two-thirds vote by one vote, one vote over the two-thirds, and we went co-educational. Those who did not like it thought, well, we were still Claremont Men's College. We can always revert, but it proved to be uh, an outstanding and the correct vote. And the initial women that came in were, uh, were, were outstanding. Uh, they, Meredith Ullman, who was one of the initial class, came in, and they, they faced, faced some harassment, but she was president of the senior class when she graduated. And then when we finally put women in the, uh, we started out in women by suite, then we finally put them in the uh, in turtle dorms, and those dorms had urinals. So. So the women put potted plants in those journals. 
that would water all the medic. So I was very fond of those initial women who came to see it. They, they did a terrific job, and it was obviously the right decision. So, Jack, I've heard a story that if the vote had not been successful, what would you have done? Well, if, if the vote had not passed and it was a solid majority, Jill and I thought we could try again. But if it was less than, less than a, half of the board, then it was clearly that uh, I was trying to lead the college in the wrong direction. It was time for us to pack our bags and try something else. Well, we're so delighted that it worked out, that we got that vote. <laughs> so, Pamela, let's switch to you. Um, talking about challenges, um, one of the things that your administration was known for, and your leadership in particular, was developing a strategic plan that the college could rely on for long-term growth Tell me what some of your challenges were with that strategic plan when you came to Claremont. Um, well, thank you, Sue, and I'm delighted to be here with Jack and with Hiram. So thank you very much for getting this together. Um, I don't think it was triggered at all by strategy or master planning, uh, but um, I had the uh, fabulous opportunity to succeed Jack Stark. And he had been here 28 years. He was like a founder. He's an alumnus of the college. Um, and his brilliant wife, Jill, <laughs> to succeed her as well. <laughs> and here I was. I came from uh, the East Coast, outsider, research university, not a liberal arts college. And I was a woman um, to be the next president of Claremont Men's College as far as a lot of the alumni still thought about it. So anyway, that would have been a challenge in any context and even regardless of gender actually to, uh, to succeed Jack. But the positive part of succeeding Jack was also the opportunities because the college was in such magnificent shape. It had a fabulous mission. Um, it had a very strong board of trustees and continues to do so. It had robust alumni who were very involved with the college and so on. So I think if you balance it out, the opportunities and advantages weigh out. They definitely outweighed those particular challenges. The second challenge, though, <clears throat> was as a, I think this was a consequence of being a very, very young college. And I had uh, seen this play out at my prior institution when I was a dean there, was taking the wonderful board of trustees and adjusting them from a, a very strong fiduciary board, very careful with finances, investments, audit, uh, quality of student life and all of that, but that if we were really going to have a strong and robust master plan and strategy plan, it was going to take a lot of new resources. So the evolution of the board from being what I would call a very traditional fiduciary board, which is critically important, to becoming actually a resource development board are creating a culture of philanthropy was a critical transition um, that that board made, but it needed to be made before we could actually accomplish what we wanted to do. Because to do those things, uh, frankly, requires a substantial amount of philanthropy to do it. So thank goodness there was a lot of leadership on the board and that transition took place. And I'm forever grateful to the board and the alumni for recognizing that and for making that successful transition. And because of that successful transition, I think you're doing pretty well, President Chodosh. <laughs> yes, very well, very, very well. Okay. Well, Pam, an another uh, aspect of your presidency was that you recruited 65% of our tenured faculty during, yes. during your administration. Tell me a little bit about your philosophy with faculty recruiting. Um, I realized fairly early on 
that one of the um, strategic strengths of CMC was and could continue to be part of the Claremont Colleges. Uh, there's a lot of tension around that, but on the other hand, there's a lot of strengths to that as well. That combined with our focused mission meant that we did not try to have every field of knowledge in liberal arts covered in our college because many of them, for example, art history, was covered at Scripps and at Pomona College. So we could really focus, we had 10 departments, now there are more disciplines represented in departments than just 10, but I realized that this college could have in those disciplines the very best faculty in Claremont and among all liberal arts colleges if we just really, really focused on those disciplines which we were really committed to. So that was the strategy and then we followed that strategy um, through uh, retirements, some people left, enlargement of resources, and so on. Then secondly, fortunately, um, our wonderful alumnus and board member, Robert Day, wanted to give a major gift in the field of economics. And that bothered some of the uh, non-economists, thinking that, oh my goodness, we're going, it was already the biggest department, it's only going to get bigger. And I looked at them and said, do you know what that gift just did? It has taken care of your department beautifully, and now I, the board, and the rest of us can think about all the other departments and adjust our time and effort to do that, and that's exactly what we were able to, to do. So it was really a, an honor and a privilege to be able to effectuate an already existing excellent teacher-scholar model and continue to do that in the recognition of that particular strategy. That's great. Pam, let me, let me ask you, what are you most proud of? I actually wrote about this in the um, <clears throat> CMC Special Anniversary Edition. In my mind, uh, Claremont McKenna College is the most successful young liberal arts college in the United States, bar none. I don't think anything comes close to that. And it starts from the founding and George Benson and Jack Stark. I mean, everything that's been done, it's all a cumulative uh, process. Being in the Claremont Colleges, having fabulous teacher scholars, having fabulous alumni and so on. And if I could just do a shout out for the alumni, it is an alumni weekend. You are the product of the college. We exist to educate young men and now women. And our success is through your lives, both personally and professionally. And that is the measurement of what it is that we're doing. Um, for faculty who are here, I do respect your scholarship, but I just want to focus on the alumni right now. In, in thinking about the alumni of this particular college, we have had a history of extraordinarily strong boards. Um, I certainly inherited it from Jack, and I, Hiram, you've inherited it from the time that I was here as well. We've had very strong alumni uh, boards at the national level and at the regional level. We have advisory boards for the Kravis Leadership Institute. You hire our graduates, you mentor our graduates. The list goes on and on and on. And very importantly, um, if you were looking at data, um, the amount of of philanthropy at this college per graduate has to be number one in the country. Number one. So <clears throat> I just want to do a shout out to the alumni because um, I am so proud of this, this history and how far we've come and how successful we are in, in accomplishing our mission. It absolutely could not be done without the qualities and characteristics that I tried to summarize with respect to all of you in the room. Thank you. Right. So Pam, we had set a goal of 600 million for the capital campaign that you helped oversee and, and make a success and busted through that to set a record of 635 million. And a lot of the investment is tangible that you can see here on campus. 
Any remarks about that capital campaign and the success that that drove for the college? Well, as I said, it's easy to write a strategic plan and a master plan, but if you really want to accomplish it, you're not going to build it off students' tuition dollars. So you're really going to have to have it come through the generosity of the alumni. But that generosity follows from many, many reasons, um, one of which is I think the alumni care so much about the mission of this college they see how the college has changed their lives. Uh, they see how, it, how it's contributed to their personal and professional outcomes in their lives. The close relationships they would had with faculty uh, here and coming back to see those faculty. I know Gordon Bjork was here today. Uh, he's been retired for quite a while, but he's back here uh, giving a talk today. Um, and those things, those things really, really, really matter. So I think if there is that strong identity of your alumni with their time here, the mission here, and the relevancy of the mission in today's world for today's students, those conversations can go very well, okay? They go very, very well. I do want to say thanks to the board at the time um, when we were trying to decide the priorities for the campaign. It might not look like it today, but the priority of the campaign was absolutely on human capital. And no discussion about a building whatsoever. We had to pay all the attention to the quality of the students and the student experience and financial aid, and we had to pay, secondly, to the quality of the faculty, faculty chairs, support for faculty, and so on. It was only after that part of the campaign, and I want to say kudos to that discipline. That was a very disciplined, absolutely disciplined approach. It was only after that we had accomplished that that we were able to do the pivot to the master plan and yielded the Kravis Center, Byzantz Tennis Center, re remodeling the Athenaeum, Crown Hall, I won't go through all of them, and um, we also did all of the initial work for the Roberts Pavilion, which uh, Hiram has been able to accomplish, and it looks beautiful tonight as we look out in that, that particular direction. But I, I really want to say that capital came only, only after we had paid attention to our human capital. And I think one thing that I think, Jack, you did magnificently was just that. I mean, I think that you were very careful financially, but that you were very careful about that balance between human capital and uh, the physical capital. So a very good, very good wise decisions. Thank you. Great. So Hiram, now we're over to you. And we are in the middle of the campaign for CMC Responsible Leadership, and we have three amazing pillars that we are supporting. Do you want to talk about the pillars and how you feel about where the college is going? Well, thank you, Sue. And this is an amazing moment for me to sit here with Jack uh, and, and, um, and Pam. I, I'm listening to them and I'm thinking about our pillars, but our pillars are sitting already on a, several floors of foundation. And I think you can see, as Pam said, there's been no young college that has succeeded as quickly and as wildly successfully as CMC has. Arguably, there's been no other university in the country that has done this so quickly. And I think it's partly because the school not only trains and educates leaders of the future, but the school has reflexively internalized responsible leadership in its own leadership. Uh, Pam talked about the wonderful relationship between the president and the board. Our board chair, David McGrublian, is here. I know that Pam had very close relationships with the board chairs, as did Jack. And when you have those relationships and that quality of leadership running the school in responsible ways, fiscally responsible, focusing on the human side, that's what it's all about. You have this magical combination of 
leadership factors that then allow the school to grow at this extraordinary pace. I remember when I started, I asked for some data on endowment per student. And then I asked for the founding of the school to be put in the right-hand column. And when I looked at the 1946 compared to where we were, I think we were 10th at the time, I fell off my chair in astonishment at how it was that a school founded in 46 could have achieved that level of accomplishment. So I want everyone here to understand that often we look at a presidency in the, the span of the years that the president served. That's really not the right frame of reference. Today, we're doing things only because of George Benson and because of Jack's leadership. His vision for the institutes, for example, was well beyond anything that any liberal arts college had considered. The only reason that we've been successful during my term is because of the extraordinary ambition and accomplishment that Pam reached. Uh, when we went to develop our CMC strategy, we had the precedent of Pam's strategic plan that made the activity of developing a strategy that much easier. So when we did get to trying to memorialize what we had been doing for the first year, few years into a strategy, we started with what? We started with the greatest asset that the college has, which is its mission, to produce thoughtful and productive leaders, responsible leaders in, in business, government, and the professions. And by sticking to that lane, by sticking to that mission, just as Pam described, not getting spread too thin to be like other schools, it's allowed us to focus and deepen our commitments and roots so that we can really spread out our branches to great success. The second was the idea of expanding opportunity for all students. Now, that meant financial aid, but it also meant the financial cost of taking advantage of the college beyond the cost of attendance, the Kravis Opportunity Fund to eliminate all kinds of financial barriers. But it also meant dealing with the social barriers that students uh, may confront when they arrive at college and may not come from uh, private school backgrounds or other backgrounds where they're accustomed to the kind of culture and classroom activity. So we went to work on expanding opportunities, the growth of the Saul Student uh, Center for Student Opportunity. The Sauls are here tonight to be congratulated for their great leadership on that. And when you look at the data coming out right now in terms of what our graduates are doing, I was just looking at this today. Our graduates, five, six years out, rank second among liberal arts colleges in terms of median salary. Harvey Mudd is the only school above us, mainly because they're focused on engineers. And then when you look at the cost of attendance, the average cost of attendance of selective colleges, we are sixth, we rank sixth in the country right now. When you look at social mobility data, the Raj Chetty study done at Stanford before he went to Harvard, we were third in the country in social mobility measuring those families and students that start in the bottom quartile of the U.S. economy and go to the top 1%. So opportunity. And then third, we knew we had to deal with this tremendous challenge, global challenge, national challenge of preparing our students in business, government, and the professions for a world dominated by science, by computational technologies, and by all kinds of applied science. And we had had a wildly successful program with our peers at Keck Science. Pam worked on this very, very hard when she was here, and she knows all the challenges there. But in the end, we could not attract the resources to sciences when we were together with the two other schools. And when that, that sea parted, we came up with a very audacious vision. You'll hear about this tomorrow morning both in Ron's talk as well as the, the town hall, to create a completely next generation integrated sciences program with a computational core, but in a CMC way at the intersections of business, policy, ethics, and all of the disciplines where we are strongest. That strategy, as Pam said, could only work if we could fund it. And upon the success that Pam built with philanthropy and a culture of philanthropy at CMC, 
we were able to set our goal at 800 million, but today, 13 months in advance of when we will complete the, call, the, the, the goal, we're now at $920 million. And we're only at this level because of that reflexive value of responsive, responsible leadership in the leadership of the college and the response of our alumni themselves as leaders in society to respond to that challenge with us. So Hiram, we've seen uh, what's sometimes affectionately known as the pit um, you want to talk about what we're now calling the East Campus? Well, it, we're, Good branding. And we're, we're, actually, we're actually calling it now the Roberts Campus. <laughs> um, so the pit, uh, basically we had, the Claremont Colleges had owned the pit. We had owned a parcel of the pit. But then a couple years ago, we saw an opportunity that maybe as we were going to put sciences over on the baseball field that it would open up the horizon to the east. And we very quietly started to work on purchasing the additional parcels. There was an eight acre parcel on 6th Street that Pomona and CMC had a right to purchase that Pam had negotiated. We purchased that. We then turned to Pitzer that owned a 17 acre parcel because they had bought some land north of Foothill. They were more open to selling that land to us. And then we had a little corner in the Northeast that we had to complete to own the entire thing. That parcel, folks, is 75 acres. Our current footprint, our historic campus footprint, is 77 acres. It doubles the size of our campus. It creates a 152-acre campus. And for those of you who like to focus on what Pomona is doing or not doing, Pomona's campus is 140 acres. <laughs> so again, that was great, but what were we going to do with the pit? And how would we fund what we would do with the pit? And that produced a whole new vision for the master plan to basically build a sports bowl in that area of the pit that cannot uh, handle high density use, we can build development along the southern edge of it. And then from the Sciences Center built on the baseball field, build three malls. The extension of the North Mall from Kravis Center all the way through Bauer to the baseball field where the new Day Science Center will be. A diagonal mall from the Day Science Center down to Roberts Pavilion over Center Court and then eventually a southern mall that will cross the football field across Claremont Boulevard with a, what I expect to be an iconic bridge to develop a mall along 6th Street on that east side of Claremont Boulevard. And that vision, folks, we will show you tomorrow. I'm sure many of you have seen it online. It is spectacular. And then George Roberts came along and said that he would fund the infrastructure to do that, which allows us then to leverage that infrastructure to attract donations to build the facilities that will be on that mall to produce the programs that we're going to do for our students and faculty. That's fantastic. And our athletes have had so much success in the last couple of years, including our Athena tennis team that won the NCAA title yesterday. Second time. Well, Pam had the vision with George to build Robert's Pavilion, which really gave us a facility to match the prowess of our athletics, our student leader athletes. And what's really amazing here, folks, and there's, I don't think there's any place in the country that you can become a competitive athlete, study hard, succeed in the classroom like non-athletes, and be a leader on the campus. I, it's just in this day and age of the professionalization of amateur sports, the amount of specialization that competitive athletes have to undergo, it is unheard of. And our student athletes do that and they do it magnificently. And yes, they are winning national championships. Fantastic. 
So now I'd love to do a lightning round where I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions and ask each of you to give your perspective uh, from your time and campus. So uh, let's start with Jack. And this is the question for the group. Who was your favorite Athenaeum speaker and why? <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> I would probably say David McCullough. We had him a number of times. He's very articulate, uh, a, a great fellow. Uh, but uh, I, all in all, I would probably say David McCullough. Um, I would say Salmon Rushdie. Um, this was after his Satan Verses had been published and after the Ayatollah Khomeini had issued the fatwa. And um, he had gone into hiding for several years and was still not out and about too much. He was very careful about that. So that was the background. But I always measured some of the um, aspects of the Athenaeum with, did the person come and spend a day on campus? Absolutely, he did. That means he went into literature classes. Faculty could arrange that they would actually have readings that he had written, and they would be able to have read them in advance and engage with him. So in addition to it being an amazing intellect and uh, such an extraordinary public speaker and a meaningful one, I always measured that extra time that someone would give us to spend a day on campus. Secondly, he continues to be one of the world's strongest human rights advocates about freedom of speech. It was so when he came here, that's a very important topic at CMC and it continues to be an important topic for our society. And so I think it was really meaningful for the students to hear him talk about that and to see someone with that courage and integrity to live a life the way that he felt was important to be lived in the context of, 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 of his day and time. It's always so hard for me to answer these questions. I mean, <laughs> I everyone know. from Arthur Brooks to Louise Gluck this year, we had a wonderful 75th group of speakers, just phenomenal program. I, I want to change the question just for a moment to say that my favorite moments on the app are actually the student questions. And this year, we had one of our alums, a law professor at Arizona State, giving a very esoteric talk about the 14th Amendment. And two freshmen asked each different questions that were so brilliant, I thought, gosh, I've never read the 14th Amendment. And I had to basically reattach my jaw to my mouth because they were that sophisticated. And it is the student questions. Noah Feldman, for example, was here and told me, Hiram, your students are better than my students at Harvard Law School because they ask better questions, more neutrally framed and more incisive, and they know more about the topic. So let me ask a question about who your favorite commencement speaker was. We've had some fantastic speakers. Jack, you want to start? <laughs> Uh, commencement speakers tend to be <laughs> very much the same, uh, <laughs> all too long. Um, but one of my favorite was Peter Uberoth. And, and the reason for that was he had just stepped down as uh, commissioner of baseball. And all the students, we didn't know this, all the students when I introduced him took off their border boards and put on a baseball hat. <laughs> It, it, was, it, was, it was fantastic. He gave a very good talk, but I was more impressed with the students than I was with the talk. We have to name one. Okay. My, I guess my favorite commencement speaker um, was Seamus Haney. And I, um, you know, he's such a lyrical poet. And um, he reaches out to so many people with such amazing empathy. And he included his poetry and his address. His address was just so beautiful and lyrical and meaningful, and I love his accent as well. <laughs> okay. So uh, that was the most memorable one while I was president. Uh, again, I'm going 
I'm going to say that my favorite graduation speech was Isabel Lilius, who none of you know because she was one of our students. Um, she gave such a good talk that when Christine Lagarde was graduation speaker that Christine Lagarde said it was the best graduation speech she had ever heard and she invited Isabel and her mom to the IMF as her special guest. I, 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 want, to talk, I want to talk about one other. We had William Styron. We were sitting on the stage and I leaned over to him and said, I'm going to introduce you now. And he took my arm and said, I can't do this. And I said, what do you mean you can't do this? He said, I can't give this talk. And I said, yeah, yeah, yes, you can. <laughs> so so it, it seemed like a half an hour, but it was only two or three minutes. So I got up and introduced him. He came up to the stage. He had it all written out. He gave the talk. It was an excellent talk. And when he uh, wrote his book, he talked about that talk at CMC. He suffered from depression. I thought if he didn't get up, I would end up giving a, an extemporaneous commencement talk, but it was, a, it was an experience. That's a hard one to top. Um, uh, what is a tradition unique to CMC that comes to mind? Well, uh, well I'll start this one. I think so. I think um, <laughs> so the tradition that comes to mind for me is ponding. Uh, and, and this, is, this is the only accomplishment that I have on Jack and Pam, is I was the only president of CMZ ever to be ponded. <laughs> can, I, can I tell the story just, to, yeah. just for a moment? So this is my first year. Uh, Priya was driving back from the East Coast. She wasn't here. She made the mistake of telling the staff it was my birthday. Word spread. We were having a welcome back for faculty dinner in the AF, and all of a sudden I looked out and there was 150 students out by the fountain. And people got very concerned about that, and they said, Hiram, they, they're thinking they're gonna pond you. I was like, I'm going out the back. <laughs> I went out the back of the AF, and I was shocked that there weren't students there waiting for me. I was like, well, we gotta work on that a little bit. Went home, we got a call from John Ferranda. John said, Hiram, there's 200 students waiting here for you. I was like, well, I'm, not, I'm from Jersey. I'm not that dumb. <laughs> then I got a call from the dean saying, Hiram, there's 100 students marching to your house. I was like, okay. So I was ready for them. I opened my door. I got rid of a lot of my stuff, my wallet. They sang a really beautiful happy birthday. So I had to submit. So I said, what do I do now? They, I said, do we walk over there? And they, no, we have to carry you. <laughs> and they carried me in quarters, but some were stronger than others. <laughs> And by the time we got there, it was like a scene out of Life of Brian. And there, I said, well, okay, how do you, how, do I just step in? No, we have to toss you in. Well, you know, that, that fountain is about five feet wide. I'm 5'10", and it's about like, it looked about six inches deep. And I'm thinking, God, if I don't die, the trustees are gonna kill me. Uh, and there it is. So uh, that's, that's my favorite today. Uh, uh, another uh, one is uh, the uh, senior thesis parties that are also <laughs> around those fountains with a little bubbly, uh, little music, and it's just such a joyous occasion to see them on campus. So that's definitely a tradition here. Jack, is there a tradition that comes to mind for you as your favorite? CMC started with GIs. Uh, it had no money. Uh, we recruited at the discharge centers. They brought the GIs in. They housed them in what we now call, used to call Story House, Old Grove House, and in the basement of Bridges Auditorium. The sophomores used to give the freshmen haircuts if you, you got a GI haircut. That today would be harassment, of course, but uh, Pomona wore little green beanies, and the CM3 freshmen had haircuts. But I, I want to tell a story about Donald McKenna. Donald McKenna was the first money that came to CMC. He went to the board of the, of the graduate school who was responsible for the new institution. He said, I'll give you $25,000. Let's start a new college. Let's start Claremont McKenna College, or let's start a men's college. It had been written up by a guy by the name of Russell Story. They said, 25 is not enough. You need $100,000. So he got with uh, 
Bob Bernard, and they scouted around, and they managed to get a little over $80,000, most of it from R.K. Pitzer, 50000 of it. And they went back in June of 46, got permission to start, and they brought the students in in September. Now, you know, you can't even outline an environmental impact statement in that time now. But those, those, those were different, different times. And Donald was a force throughout his life. And when it came time to name the college, we decided it should be named after him. But when I was acting president and proposed to be president, he wanted to visit Jill and I in our home. So he came and visited. Years later, the only trustee that did that. Years later, he said, you know, when I visited you in your home, I said, yeah, I remember that. He said, you know, I thought you would be an okay president. You know, I thought, a C plus, maybe a B minus. <laughs> but I thought Jill would be an outstanding president's wife and together she would pull you forward. <laughs> Donald McKenna was a very perceptive man. Uh, I want to thank you so much for this incredible panel, and I'd like to ask you all to share appreciation for Jack, Pamela, and Hiram. Thank you. 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 Thank you.